Welcome to Information Service Engineering. This is lecture number one, Information, Natural Language and the Web. In this very first part of the lecture, we are focusing on the question how to get information, of course, from the web. So for this, we have prepared a small experiment. You all know the greenhouse effect. Of course, you know that by global warming is a, a huge deal, of course, in the media today. So the greenhouse effect, we have light energy. These are the white arrows here in the graphics. They are emitted by the sun. And this light energy warms the Earth's surface. And the Earth's surface again reflects the energy back as heat. These are the orange arrows. And this warms the atmosphere because much of the heat is captured by greenhouse gas molecules such as water, carbon dioxide and methane. So now the question we want to answer is, when was this greenhouse effect discovered? So what you're going to do, of course, is you ask your favorite search engine on the web. And this doesn't have to be Google, of course. Nice thing about contemporary search engines is that you can pose questions in natural language. So we can simply type in the search, search string, when was the greenhouse effect discovered? And ta-ta, Google will give you an answer, 1896. The greenhouse effect was discovered more than 100 years ago, blah, blah, blah. And here it tells you it was discovered by the Swedish scientist Svante Arrhenius. Hmm, I thought to myself, okay, I did actually this last year. So this year I wanted to verify the result. And surprise, surprise, in 2021, the result changed and it was 1859. And there was also no notion of Svante Arrhenius. It was there a, an Irish physicist called John Tyndall who was responsible for discovering the greenhouse effect. So which should I trust? Why has this information changed? As you all know, there are millions or billions of documents on the web. And every second, probably thousands of documents are edited, updated, and they are changing, which means us the information on the web is highly dynamic and it changes. And also the underlying data structures that are used in the search engines to represent exactly this kind of information or knowledge, they are also dynamically updated and changed. So therefore this is new information. And of course, this now is presented to you by Google. Okay, you might become a little bit suspicious now and you think, okay, let's verify this so there are more NG search engines on the web than just plain Google. Let's see what's happening, let's say, for example, at Bing. When was the greenhouse eff <coughs> effect discovered? Surprise, surprise, again, a different result. Here we see that, for example, the greenhouse effect was discovered in 1827. Excuse me. And of course, not by John Tyndall directly or Svante Arrhenius. It tells you that it was discovered already by Joseph Fourier more than 30 years earlier. And Joseph Fourier, you might know, mathematician and physicist, um, who is, well, for example, also responsible for the Fourier analysis, you might know. So now, whom should you trust? I mean, of course, you can ask more sources on the web. You can also ask, let's say, an encyclopedia. And as an encyclopedia, you might ask Wikipedia on the web or you go to your favorite printed encyclopedia, no matter what. And you will see that the problem in determining the exact date when the greenhouse effect was discovered is, is difficult because the origins of that turn, that this is what the encyclopedia will tell you, is a bit unclear. So most times French mathematician Joseph Fourier is given credit as the first person to coin the term because Already in 1824, he had the conclusion that the Earth's atmosphere functions similar like a so-called hotbox. This is a small device that is a so-called heliothermometer, an insulated wooden box whose lid is made of transparent glass. And this was developed by Swiss physicist Horace Benedict de Saussure. And this little box prevented cool air from outside from mixing with warm air inside. So this is like a hothouse. And Fourier, however, he neither used the exact term greenhouse effect nor credited atmospheric gases um, with keeping the Earth warm. This again was now really the Swedish physicist and physical chemist Svante Arrhenius. 
and he's credited with the origins of the term in 1896 as our original result and he published the very first plausible climate model that explained how gases in the earth's atmosphere trap heat he referred to that as hothouse theory not as greenhouse effect but of course you see often then truth lies deeper and who knows probably there is another completely unknown physicist who probably was already referring about these causes and effects already earlier so knowledge usually is dynamic there is probably not such a thing as a universal truth so this is one thing what is what is also for sure besides what you do let's say for example in mathematics but even there also theories are up there but you can prove them then they are definitely true based of course on all your basic assumptions so dealing with knowledge is a rather complicated stuff but we won't postpone it uh, we will postpone this to a later point in time in the lecture what we want to do now is we want to analyze a bit more the search result that we really get from the search engine. So let's take a look here. What we see here as a result when we are looking for the greenhouse effect are two columns. So most search engines organize it like that. Some also display it to you in a single column and there in the upper part there is this small little box that you see here on the right side. However, so let's start with the left side. What you have here are the results from the typical traditional search engine indexes. So these are web pages, news articles, tweets, and so on and so on. These are all documents that are reflected in the search engine's index. And by the query you are asking the search engine, there is made a match with the document corpus that is reflected by the index. And then this match is given a ranking based also on lots of your, let's say, personal information and of course your, your location, for example, that the search engine might have. And then a ranking is created accordingly. So this is typical search engine behavior. Search engine functionality dates back 40 or 50 years. So this is done the same way like before. What is relatively new, so Google introduced its so-called knowledge graph in 2012, is exactly this little box on the side. As soon as in your search query a so-called entity is detected and here the entity in the search query is um, greenhouse effect information about that entity will be retrieved from the search engines knowledge graph and this is a graph like structure where domain knowledge of facts are represented here in form of structured data and this is displayed additionally to the search result to fulfill additional needs or search needs of the user. And also the, the knowledge graph here is used to improve the search results in general. But what does it know to, uh, what does it mean to know something, you know, and to represent knowledge also within a search engine in terms of a knowledge graph? So the question is, what does it mean to know the greenhouse effect? Coming back to our example, if I ask you now, so what do you know about the greenhouse effect? Then you might probably tell me, yeah, the greenhouse effect is kind of an atmospheric phenomenon and an atmospheric phenomenon is a natural phenomenon. What you do here is you put this entity greenhouse effect in a class of similar things. So it's the class of atmospheric phenomena. And also what you do here, you say all atmospheric phenomena are also natural phenomena by Saying this, it's also completely clear that the greenhouse effect is a natural phenomenon that you see here. You might know more. So, for example, greenhouse effect is related also to greenhouse gases, especially, of course, it's caused by greenhouse gases. And what are greenhouse gases? Yeah, you might know some of them. For example, carbon dioxide. And if you are a carbon dioxide specialist, you for sure know that carbon dioxide has been discovered by Flemish scientist Jan Baptist van Helmont. However, nobody knows this guy today anymore. More you know from our experiment that we did recently, so you know that um, greenhouse effect was discovered by Joseph Fourier in 1824. And you might have seen also that Joseph Fourier is a physicist. And you might know that this guy lived from 1768 to 1830. So this is a rather small example of what is a knowledge graph. However, this, of course, does not reflect the entirety of the greenhouse effect. 
It tells you only a glimpse of the knowledge of things which are known around the greenhouse effect and how it can be explained, how it relates to other things that also all have to be explained to really understand them. The machine itself is much dumber than we are. We have, um, let's say, the benefit that we can interpret the names of the things we have given here. We can interpret that the physicist, for example, this is a person and to do physics, this means physicist is kind of a profession. And we also know that a person like Joseph Fourier, he was born at a specific date and then he died at a specific date. So everything which is known about Joseph Fourier usually deals in the time span or comes comes associated with the time span between his birth date and the death date. So this is additional knowledge about the stuff we have simply by reading the names of the entities and the relations and connecting it with the knowledge we have in our head that we know from our experience. The ultimate goal now would be also to bring this kind of knowledge into this knowledge graphs. And how to deal with that we will see later on in the lecture when we are dealing with knowledge graphs. So far what we have seen is okay there is a construct which is known as knowledge graph and information for example that you are looking for on the web there are knowledge graphs that support search engines in preparing and retrieving exactly this kind of information that you are looking for. However things are getting much more complicated since the machine does not understand the names that we are used here and therefore of course we have to deal with language and the interpretation of language so in the next part of the lecture we are dealing with communication language and understanding <laughs>